Hello Copperheads, my name is Kupri and I'm so happy to be with you again for another week learning together about Wilson's disease. Last week we covered four different clinical imaging techniques. Number one, projectional radiography. Number two, computerized tomography. Number three, magnetic resonance imaging. And number four, ultrasonography. If you haven't had a chance to check that out yet, you can go watch it by clicking up here. And what I want to do today is share with you how these four clinical imaging techniques can help us look into our abdomen in order to confirm or exclude a Wilson's disease diagnosis. At this point, you might be asking yourself, why so many different techniques and how do doctors know which one to use? If you watched last week's video, you have probably figured out that the number one difference is that these techniques produce different kinds of images and each technique is better at picking up certain features of your body versus others. Ideally, the technique to be used in each particular case would be chosen based on what is the best technique we can use to visualize what we're looking for. However, in the real world, this decision can also be affected by availability and cost. Availability because, for example, ultrasound equipment is relatively common and can be found at many local health centers and small hospitals, while MRI scanners are not as common and oftentimes can only be found at larger hospitals. So, as a result, you might have access to an ultrasound right away, but accessing an MRI scan might be difficult or even impossible for you. And cost because, for example, ultrasounds are cheaper than MRI scans, so depending on your financial situation and the kind of healthcare system available to you, either you or your doctor might have to make certain choices based on money. On that positive and not at all concerning note, let's talk about today's plan. Back in Copperheads 5, I told you about every single symptom of Wilson's disease that can be perceived without special equipment, and also took some time to explain the underlying issues that cause those symptoms. For example, back then I told you that if you get jaundice, meaning if your skin and eyes turn yellow, it's because you have liver damage. So, what I'm gonna do today is to refer to some of those underlying issues, specifically the ones that can be detected with abdominal imaging. And I'm gonna show you examples, mostly from CT scans, because that's what I think is easiest and most clear for those of us who are not doctors. But you have to keep in mind something very important. Interpreting clinical images takes years of training and expertise. I cannot teach you how to do that in one YouTube video. The information I am able to give you is the following. What signs of Wilson's disease can a trained professional observe from abdominal imaging? My humble ultimate goal for today is that next time you go in for abdominal imaging, you know what to expect in terms of what information you could potentially get from said abdominal imaging. All right, without further ado, let's get started. Number one, hepatomegaly. Hepatomegaly, also called enlarged liver, happens when your liver becomes bigger than it should be. Here is a CT scan that shows it really well. The liver is this vaguely triangular thing on the left here, and for example, this lower part is not supposed to reach this far down. This liver is so big that it's pushing other organs out of place and possibly disrupting blood flow, pressing on some nerves, causing pain, and so on. Number two, hepatic steatosis. Hepatic steatosis, also called fatty liver, happens when excess fat builds up in your liver. Fatty liver can come in different patterns. Here is a CT scan that shows diffuse hepatic steatosis. Diffuse means that it's not concentrated in certain points, but it's just all over the place. How do we know that this liver has diffuse hepatic steatosis? The answer is radiodensity. By the way, if you need a reminder of what radiodensity is, please check out Copperhead 12. 
Anyways, normally the spleen here on the right should be slightly less radio dense than the liver here on the left. However, this particular liver has a radio density of 59 HU, which is lower, a lot lower than the radio density of the spleen at 127 HU. And the reason is that these liver cells have quite a lot of fat inside of them. Since fat has a very low radio density, the presence of excess fat all over the liver just brings down the radio density of the entire organ. Mild cases of hepatic steatosis don't really cause problems, but more extreme cases can lead to liver problems such as number three, cirrhosis. Cirrhosis, also called liver scarring, happens when the liver receives long-term damage and as a result, healthy liver tissue gets slowly replaced with scar tissue. Once again, here is a CT scan. This thing on the left is the liver. It looks kind of shrunk and deformed and the edge is all lumpy and irregular instead of smooth. So this is in fact a very advanced case of cirrhosis. I don't really know what happened to this patient, but cirrhosis can lead to serious problems such as liver failure. Coming up next, number four, splenomegaly. Splenomegaly, also called enlarged spleen, happens when the spleen becomes bigger than it should be. Here is a CT scan showing this cirrhotic liver on the left and this enlarged spleen on the right. The spleen is not supposed to reach this far down and just like an enlarged liver, an enlarged spleen is pushing other organs out of place and possibly blocking blood flow, pressing on nerves, causing pain, etc. Number five, ascites. Ascites happens when there is excess buildup of fluid in the abdomen. Here is a CT scan of massive ascites. All of this kind of intermediate gray, all of this, all of that, that's all ascites. That is all fluid that's not supposed to be there. So this person's abdomen is super swollen, which is painful and uncomfortable in and of itself. And of course the fluid is putting a lot of pressure all over, which can damage other organs and body parts as well. Number six, nephrolithiasis. Nephrolithiasis, also called kidney stone disease, happens when different chemical compounds crystallize inside your kidneys into solid chunks. Here is an ultrasound, not a CT scan, of some kidney stones. Kidney stones can cause a huge amount of pain as well as other symptoms such as constant need to go pee, blood in the urine, sweating, nausea, vomiting, etc. Number seven, nephropathy. Nephropathy is just a fancy name for kidney disease. Kidney problems can come up in Wilson's disease in many different ways. Sometimes the kidney problems can be spotted with clinical imaging, sometimes with other tools such as urine tests. I'm not gonna show you any images of this right now because I just don't wanna swamp you with too much information. And finally, number eight, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis, also called pancreas inflammation, happens when the body detects there's something wrong with the pancreas and kind of goes into red alert mode. Like nephropathy, pancreatitis can sometimes be spotted with clinical imaging, sometimes with other tools such as urine tests. And again, I'm not gonna show you images of this right now because I know I have already thrown enough information at you for one day. On that note, I want to thank you for making it this far. And I know I haven't told you in a while, but I'm really, really proud of you for wanting to educate yourself about Wilson's disease. And please, please, please come back next week because we have a very, very, very important topic coming up, liver biopsy, which is the test that can give you the most definite answers to the question, do you have Wilson's disease or not? See you next week, and until then, you can find me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, or by email. My name is Kupri. See you there, Copperheads.